Hello, and welcome to Ben and Kurt Hill Hurts, the culture cast caught at the crossroads of curation and castration. I'm Ben. And I'm Kurt. And this week we are concluding our action-packed, epic, two-part series on the collected <laughs> works of auteur, <laughs> master filmmaker, and all-around real good guy, <laughs> Troy Duffy. We're here. Yep. And I think after after the Lynch series... I like these two parters. These are nice. These are like we started last time <laughs> and, and we're done. We'll now. be done in yep. an hour or so. Yep. And until, that's, that's good until Colon Legion comes out, right? And then the TV series comes out, and then we're gonna have to follow up on all this bullshit. I I read up on three mm-hmm. or the pre, the pre production of three, yep. and an article came out last year that said not Norman Reedus is that his name? Norman Reedus. Reedus, not him. Sean Patrick Flannery, is that the other one? That's the other guy. He said that neither of them would end up being in the third one if it does come out. Really? Yeah. And uh, they weird. they said See, something... See, I, I read the opposite of that. Well, I had read... Uh, I don't remember what website it came I, from. I read Troy Duffy saying that they said to him that they will drop everything yeah. to be in his third masterpiece. I read that. I read that too, and then I read later in the article it said that after I think the Boston bombing, mm-hmm. um, one of the the saints texted him, and they were like, "Hey, so when are we going to start working on Boondock Saints three? Because I think the people of Boston would enjoy that." Mm-hmm. And Troy was like, "I'll get right on it." And then it just hadn't happened. And then, like just a, a year or so ago, he tweeted the Sean Patrick. I can't remember his fucking name. Sean Patrick Flannery. You said Flannery. it right. I know. Already. He stated that they would not be in the third one and that the, it was a pretty big deal. Like, they really wanted to be a part of it, and he didn't say any details, but something significant had to have happened for hmm. them to take their names out of it, and they didn't make that decision lightly. So... Hmm. I don't know what fucking T Duff's up to. Maybe Troy Duffy burned another bridge. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like him. You shouldn't burn a bridge with the two main actors and the only thing you've ever been able to make. You shouldn't burn a bridge with the guy who offers you fifteen million dollars as a first time director to make your piece of shit script. Anyway, we'll get into that later. <laughs> yes, we will. Uh okay, wait, but I also read in another article that T Duffy is going to make a different movie unrelated to the Boondock Saints called the Blood Spoon Council. Have you heard of this? No. This is his next project. It's about a team of uh, of vigilantes who go after serial killers. And it's about the the fascinating FBI psychologist who's hired to to track them down. It's Boondock Saints again. Say, that <laughs> doesn't sound A dumb and B like probably what Boondock Saints 3. You know, when you make the same movie twice, why not just continue on for a third? Yeah, I apparently it works for people. Well, <laughs> yeah. the second one really didn't get the same returns that the first one yeah. did. No. Um, have you been up to anything before we... Uh, I've been listening to a lot of Sufjan Stevens. I don't know if you're familiar with I his listened, work. He had an album come out last year, right? I think his last one that came out was Carrie and Lowell a couple few years ago. Yep. I did listen to yep. that part of that one. One of the one of the greatest albums ever recorded, in my opinion, a, a real masterpiece. I haven't been listening to that one. I've been listening to some of his older stuff, uh, Seven Swans, sort of a a biblical lo-fi folk album, and then The Age of Odds, a, an electronic album by Sufjan Stevens Naturally. that is a complete <laughs> departure from the rest of his uh, from the rest of his oof. Works sometimes, doesn't work other times. I still think that he's one of the best. Uh, one of the best. Good. What have you I been up to? Have one thing that I found that I would like to share, mostly for you. Okay. I probably could have told you about this before we no, even I'm ready recorded on the recording. It's a I can't give credit to the name of the DJ because I'm a piece of shit. I forgot his name. It's okay. But uh, a DJ solely made a mixtape of. Kendrick Lamar's verses from Damn over classic Dr. Dre beats. Wow. With the idea being that they're both Compton based mm-hmm. influential rappers. And it is fucking sick. Yeah. Like, I'm not a huge Dr. Dre fan outside of like NWA. Or a huge Kendrick fan. No, not a huge Kendrick fan. Much respect for Kendrick, mm-hmm. but I'm just not super into most of his music. But 
for some reason, man, this thing bangs. That's <laughs> that's all there is to it. It's called the Damn Chronic. Mm. Sick name. <laughs> it's available for free download on datpiff.com. Oh, datpiff. Gotta love it. <laughs> datpiff exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, T Pain's best mixtape, The Iron Way, is also a Dat Piff exclusive. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Oh man, that mixtape is good. I like me a little T Pain. You do? I hope you like a lot of T Pain. I've never listened to a T Pain album. He's kind of, from my experience, which is very he's limited. A singles guy. Yeah, he's kind of a, mm-hmm. what I call a a Rick Ross guy <laughs> because that was my first experience with every single song I hear this guy on is awesome. I'm gonna listen to one of his albums, and then you're like, oh, he just he, he's all. I guess that. Rick Ross is the Sean P. Diddy Combs of <laughs> of whatever I'm talking about. Oh, man. We're three analogies deep. <laughs> Just pop that one, pop that one. We're <laughs> back to T-Pain. Listen to The Iron Way. It's a Dat Piff exclusive. It's fantastic. Now we can be back to Boondock Saints 2, Boondock All Saints, Saints Day. Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day, a.k.a. a fucking lepre- leprechaun shit on the cover of this <laughs> DVD. Peace, they say is the enemy of memory. So it had been for my boys. For some time now, their past had felt like a dream. And then, suddenly, it was back. So what do you think? I think Yagov had to kill a good man just to send us a message. I send him one right back. <laughs> now... I know last time I had said, no matter how you look at Boondock Saints 2 and 1, the only thing that you can say for certain is that the second one is worse than the first one. <sighs> now, we pro- we may disagree on this, but I will say... It's complicated. That second one is bad. I, I'm... I've come. I've jumped over. I'm not willing to defend. <laughs> I can't defend it on the merits of the first one anymore. Now Wait, that I've- you've been defending the second one on the merits of the first one? I, for a long time I did. Yeah. And then I, that was before I had watched the first one, like as an adult. Mm-hmm. And I still found it enjoyable, but I, I definitely looked at it with grown up eyes and I was like, yeah, I can, that's not the best movie ever. That's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of problems with this movie. <laughs> um, yeah. You know what my favorite thing is about Boondock Saints 2? What? My favorite thing is that Troy Duffy is such a piece of shit that anything... This movie is so dumb that anything that was good in the first one, I think, must have been an accident. And because all of, like, Troy Duffy's, like, weaknesses as a human, like, they shine... Like, they shine through in the first one, but in this one... There's just, like, left and right, just, like, as an adult. I'm just like, oh, I'm not okay with this. There's a lot of really bad things in this movie. Yeah. And uh, what's your favorite thing about it? My favorite thing about this movie? Oh, there's so much. Uh, the the first thing that comes to mind is the two leads. Mm-hmm. Some fascinating changes <laughs> in the intervening ten years, right? Okay, yeah. we've got Norman Reedus and Sean Patrick Flannery, who were like the the essence of weedy townies in the first movie. <laughs> yeah, right. Boston townies. They live in in a fucking loft. They're they're squatting, and they don't have any money for food, so they're just super skinny and they drink all the time. Right. Yep. In the second movie, <laughs> they're still in pretty good shape, but the faces, man. Yeah. The face. Their faces have changed. Norman Reedus is wearing so much makeup that he looks like Captain Jack Sparrow. (laughs) And Sean Patrick Flannery looks like the shambling corpse of Sean Patrick Flannery. (laughs) I think that... No no offense, men. All respect. You guys are the probably the best parts of these fucking movies. I know you're listening. I know you're listening, Sean. We appreciate that you came back because I don't think Troy would have had the integrity to not make the movie without you. I think he he would have just done it and Mm. it would have been way worse than it was. Now, it would have been, like, their little brothers or cousins or something. It would have Mm -hmm. been that, like, the next generation. (laughs) The worst thing I think about that was, it it was, like, it came out, like, ten years later, right? Ten years apart, yep. I think the age of the the actors, most of the actors from the first one to the second one, that ten-year gap is probably, like, the worst time in your life to like have 10 years definitely pass. for sean patrick flannery and Norman like Reedus. that's like prime 
That's like 30 to 40, you know? Yeah, and that's like, like you prime... go from being a young man to being a middle-aged man. Yeah, and that's... prime gaining weight or just getting thick. You know, just, old your, guys your just your get body, thick. Your body changes. As my wife and I say, Sean Patrick Flannery to Deca- Sean Patrick Flannery DiCaprio pretty hard, yeah. right? His head just got broader. The Alec His... Baldwin, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things happen during second puberty that nobody likes to acknowledge, but it happens. Now, now we're Irish shaman. We're monks, Irish monks. Yep, yeah. We we live in the countryside, living in the where we herd we're shepherds. Sheep. We're shepherds. That's the word for that. We're sheep the, herders. <laughs> There's a word for sheep herders. We take sheep and we make sure that animals don't kill them. It's we, kind of a Jesus thing. <laughs> we roll our own cigarettes now, and yep. we have awful fake beards. Oh Just man! Like, <laughs> incredible fucking fake Halloween beard. wigs cut yeah. to be pasted on your face. Fake beards. <laughs> yeah. Now the worst part is that Just hair sticking out straight from your face <laughs> with like like you're a fucking graphical glitch. And it, one of them had like the long wispy mustache, mm-hmm. which was not flattering. No. Now this movie came out like we said ten years later, and I I'm like horrified that. This is all Troy could come up with. Like it's the same movie. Yeah, and like he even... had one script and it wasn't <laughs> very good and he decided to make it again. Even in like execution, like the end of the first one ends on this like public execution of like we're not hiding in the shadows, we are the saints, we're going to kill bad people and Hopefully you're cool with that. You're all sinners, but make sure you're not too bad of sinners, or else we, the ultimate <laughs> sinners, will come get you, fuckers. Yeah, and, like, I got the impression that, like, you need to watch out because we're here now. Yep. And then in it's the second one... It's the end of one, the Matrix, basically. Yeah. yeah, and ten years later, no, immediately after that, we just fucking went to Ireland. We left. Bailed. Things got too hot for us. And so that... I just feel like that's... There's an untold story there. There there should be. Boondock Saints 1.5. But I don't think there is. Maybe if we have time, we'll talk about my unfit. <laughs> like, what I would... If I were to you make... You mean your Boondock Saints fan fiction that you've yeah, written? Yeah, my Boondock You're part Saints 1.5. You're part of the community 1. now? 5. I am part of the community. I'm writing a... I was going to say walkthrough. That's not the word. You're writing a treatment? I'm, I'm doing storyboarding. The, the mm. writing equivalent of storyboarding. Is it still storyboarding? It's outlining. Outlining. I'm writing mm-hmm. an outline. Thank you. Okay. I haven't been in school in a long time. You're in the pre-writing stages. Mm-hmm. I, I'm in the pre-writing stages. Very important to get your pre-writing correct, Curtis. Mm-hmm. And I might just do a reboot, actually, so I can yeah. change the things from the first one that I didn't like. I've got some ideas about some Boondock Saints chan- tangential fan fiction okay. as well, so we'll talk about this after we'll, the podcast. We'll get into this. Now, my first question for you, Ben, okay. is how do you feel in the second one... Okay. The first one, which I kind of neglected to notice until your wife pointed out to me, that the first one isn't, like, totally on the saint's side. Like, and maybe I'm drawing a few extra conclusions here that she didn't... I don't want to put words in her mouth. They're bad guys. The the viewer is on their side, but the church is not cool with it, and the... Well, isn't it? I know that the, the one priest is very upset that give... to save his own life he told uh cop's name fbi smecker smecker so it rhymes with pecker yeah, yeah. There you, that's how you remember it. <laughs> that's how you remember it was very upset with himself that he said what he had to say to survive i think mm. that and then you kind of have like the little news clips where people are pretty divided over whether the saints are good guys or not now in the second one It answers the question for you. They're fucking superheroes. (laughs) And I'm wondering how you feel knowing that the church is on their side in this one. Like, straight up, a priest comes to them, tells them what happens, says, but don't go do anything about it. Bye. (laughs) And uh, and just kind of, and then expedites them, like, or the, the, the woman. What's her name? Uh... Oh, no, okay. oh. <laughs> Eunice. Eunice. I forget, Eunice Bloom. I forget a lot. Eunice Bloom. They they send her to Costa Rica to get away at the end. So how how did how did you feel with the church actively being involved um, in the second one? Did it make it, a difference to you? 
No, no, not really. Because the first film, the the film is very much on the brother's side. Yeah. In my opinion. The film is offering the negative opinions of some people. And also, like, there's the, the first one opens with a prolepsis to after the... Uh, to after the priest has come around, right? He mm-hmm. gives the sermon about Kitty Genovese and the brothers go out and they're like, I think the Monsignor's finally gotten the point. And then they light their cigarettes in unison and fucking pimp I'm glad, off. I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't want to cut you off. But I think it's important to mention that the Kitty Genovese thing, I would not have thought to mention this, but when I watched that movie, that whole thing is pretty pretty ridiculous to draw that conclusion from it because with that that was a real thing that happened Mm -hmm. and the real effect of that was it helped to discover a fascinating psychological effect called the bystander effect in the movie they pitch it as like oh we're so desensitized to violence we don't care someone screams for help and we just ignore when really the truth is an awful thing where people are they thought it was awful but everybody collectively said someone else is probably helping her Mm -hmm. which i think is a much more fascinating and important thing to talk about than oh the world this these days it's so Mm -hmm. bad we're like i i I was like i was a little bit offended by that in the first (laughs) one and then completely wrote it off because i was like this movie's cool (laughs) like and there's a there's some question as to the reality of the popular narrative around the kitty genovese incident like as to whether or not people actually did stand by. While yeah, I she think was some people did call the police. Yeah, like yeah. there's the the story was reported one way immediately after the fact, and then kind of got picked up like that, and everyone just ran with it. But then subsequent investigations into that incident have uncovered a little bit more complication. Yeah, um, similar to Columbine. Yeah, the exact same fucking thing happened. It got picked up as a media spectacle, and then that just became the narrative forever. Yeah. Anyway off my soapbox uh i think that well as i as i said i think that the boondock saints is an evil movie and i think that the church if it uh if it did sanction the actions of vigilantes would be unchristian and that would be enough for uh, them to be heretics that's blasphemy basically to to uh, purport that god supports uh vigilante justice being meted out is directly contradicted by a verse in romans chapter 11 i believe might be chapter 13 i don't know i read it the other day it was a weird thing i was reading my bible and it was like (laughs) wait a minute the apostle relevancy the apostle paul literally wrote at one point that you should not take try to take divine justice into your own hands no yeah my next note Obviously, my notes are kind of in order. I take notes now. It's this new thing I'm trying to help me actually talk about the movie. That's pretty smart. Yeah. I haven't been doing that for a very long time. Maybe I should do that. Uh, We have our little scene where we meet Romeo, and he has his little fight to show how cool and badass he is. And he makes a thing about this speech about how crazy uh, his people are, and then he mentions Tabasco sauce, and that you'd have to be crazy to invent something like that tabasco sauce is not a mexican condiment (laughs) nor is it a hot sauce in particular (laughs) not very hot not made in mexico yeah made in louisiana i I looked it up because i was like i'm pretty sure tabasco is not a not a mexican thing yeah so i just wanted to throw that out there that 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 how, how did you feel about the character of romeo okay i didn't like it all right and it falls under one of the biggest problems with this movie is that, oh, shit, we killed Rocco. People loved Rocco. Mm. And I don't know why Smecker's not in this movie. I Until it, the very end, spoiler alert. I would assume Willem Dafoe just didn't want to do it. Yeah, Troy Duffy uh, addressed that in a pre-sequel interview. Oh, good. And he just said something vague like, you know, sometimes people's careers go in different... You know, actors have a... <laughs> Actors sometimes have different ideas about what kind of movies they want to make, and uh, and you know Willem Dafoe is where he is right now, and I love that that's yeah, making him. making good movies, yeah. so <laughs> having a successful career. Yeah, I guess he, me he, he ten years later, he doesn't have time for anything other than a cameo in the same exact boat mm-hmm. that I was in ten years ago. <laughs> yep. Except I'm not on top of the world this time around. Oh man, that documentary though, we got to talk about that eventually. Mm. Now, Romeo. It, 
and um, Bloom, they they just took the archetypes of the characters from the first one and just replaced them, Mm -hmm. which is super weird and lazy, and it's just not good. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I I think you're being unfair because because Romeo is a Mexican (laughs) and Eunice Bloom is a woman. That's true. You're right. Like a straight-up fox, too. Hot, dude. God damn. Look at her. Look at her walking. Look at all that. I can't as, s- as my wife book put it, uh, cheesecake. <laughs> this movie's filled with fucking cheesecake. I can't that shot stand where that she character. undoes her hair, oh. and like, or like the way she walks up and when she's introduced, like one, f- she's putting her feet on the opposite sides of where they should go. That super sexy, like typical yeah. walk. You know that walk that all women do. Yeah, all the time. All that the very time. natural walk. Yep. When they walk up to three fat Boston <laughs> PD while they're they're picking their nose. How about they... how about that part where fucking she like kneels Bob Marley down in front of her? So here's the thing <laughs> with Eunice Bloom. Favorite shot in the movie. The we talked last week about how it is. It seems apparent to me. And I don't want to, I'm assuming you, but I don't want to say okay. that for you. All right. I'll tell you if it is. Paul Smecker's character, I think we kind of talked about, is one of the good gay people. <laughs> like, because he's super tough and manly. Yeah. And when you look at it, you're, you're like, I don't know if Troy Duffy has ever met a gay person. Mm-hmm. I am pretty sure that this was the heart. Eunice Bloom must have been the hardest character for him to write. Because I don't think he's ever spoken to a woman or an intelligent person. <laughs> because the role of a very intelligent woman is one of the worst things I've ever seen committed to film. Yeah. I cringe. I wrote it down. I'm so fucking smart. I make smart people feel like they are retarded. That is literally <laughs> one of the dumbest things I've ever heard yeah. in my entire life. <laughs> Can you just imagine, just set the scene, Troy Duffy's sitting in front of a fucking typewriter and he writes that and he's like, ah, oh, job well done. <laughs> Nailed it. Go me. Good job, Duffster. <laughs> we're going to come, we're going to be back on top after this one. <laughs> this then we're going to get Boondock says five gonna... out of this one. <laughs> I, I think her, most of her character was just dreadful Mm -hmm. through i can't even say like through any fault of the actor just like Mm -hmm. it was just a cheap rehash of something that i thought was pretty good in the first one like Mm -hmm. i like willem dafoe in the first one so i don't know yeah yeah weird that she was like obsessed with being a cowboy (laughs) cowgirl i guess you would call (laughs) i guess call her i guess they even like ripped off the like instead of there was a firefight. They're like, there was a shoot 'em up. And you're like, really? <laughs> yeah. The same exact fucking okay. line? <laughs> well, like, yeah, you know, Boondock Saints 2 is a Boondock Saints remake. <laughs> it's just, I, I honestly think, like, Willem Dafoe was supposed to be in this. Like, he mm. just clearly, <laughs> they just... everybody else is back. Why wouldn't Willem Dafoe be? And then he was like, hey, I finished writing Boondock Saints 2. And Willem, we know you're listening. Good mm. call. Was like, no, I don't want any part of this. No, see, I'm going to be an antichrist. Yeah. And I can't do this bullshit anymore. And then he was like, what's the least amount of work I can do? And then, for some reason, I I'm, I don't know. The, I, I feel like there has to be a reason Troy Duffy made it a woman. Maybe because he thought, well, like... Well, you know, one of the most prominent criticisms of the first movie is that there are no female speaking roles by anyone who's not a druggy bitch. Right. Or and a I, child. And I think that maybe, I don't... Like, maybe to him, like, literally just doing, like, a fucking palette swap <laughs> was, like, a, like, it's different now. It's a different character. Different character. I like women. Especially <laughs> sexy ones. Like, that was... Sexy women. But they need to be smart, too. And and nice to me, even though... Dog, there's a part in the documentary where he literally says those are his expectations for a woman. He's lamenting why he can't find a girlfriend. And he says, like, yeah, man, all I want is, like, an intelligent woman who's also, like, a good person. <laughs> so hard to find. So difficult to find a woman who's intelligent and decent. Ugh. I, you know, if you ever find one, Troy, let me know. Because he's been, he's been married since two thousand six. Yeah, <laughs> concerning, right? I don't know what she's like. Troy Duffy's wife. If you're listening to this, you can talk to us. <laughs> yes, okay, we will, we will have you on the podcast. We are fascinated. 
<laughs> what do you see? Is it the Boondock Saints, the band? What's your life Is like? that appealing? <laughs> I don't know what Troy Duffy does in the Boondock Saints, the band, but... Oh, man. Yeah, well, I think he's a guitarist. Is he? I think so. There's a lot of shots of him playing the guitar in the film, in the documentary, that is, <laughs> overnight. I can't wait to talk about that, because I, I didn't watch it. <laughs> now, can I say one of the one of the biggest things that I thought was weird and different about this movie? Absolutely. There, and I think it's just like a Troy Duffy not being able to tell the difference between what he did in the first one and in the second one. But there's so much weird bullying in this movie hmm. that it just, like... Like, the Saints picked on Rocco, but they were, like, friends from way back. It felt... Dude, that part in the they... in the hotel where they, like, pretend they're about to kill him. Okay, so here's the thing. We'll... Which happens again in the second one. Two more times. <laughs> <Yeah>. We will... <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that because I have thoughts about that, too. So when they do that to Rocco... To see it the first time, that one time, I almost get it. Like, it's not, like, a friendly thing to do, but if how many times are you going to find yourself in that predicament? Like, I can <laughs> almost appreciate the... You've got to you've gotta do it. The situation. Yeah. Every man wants to do that to his friends. Now, <laughs> when they do it twice more in this movie, because <laughs> they do it to Romeo, and yeah. then... Oh, who do they do it to? They I do it again. Remember. Um... It's just weird. And they don't really know Romeo. And, like, the first night they call him, they call him, like, the greasy spick. The first night they meet him. <laughs> and the whole, like, um, Yakavetta in the second one, like, he, like, hits that guy across the teeth with a giant sausage. And it, like, breaks his jaw and knocks his teeth out. And then, like, the rest of those scenes, it's like a punchline for both the audience and the people in the room that yeah. like oh man remember when that guy got his jaw broken and now he talks funny yeah because <laughs> yeah. he said he said something he corrected a guy like that's not funny to me like that's yeah <laughs> that's what troy duffy thinks is funny though <laughs> exactly like yeah, that's, he just that's his worldview he wears it, it in this one where i don't think it's as good as the first one he still wears all of his like flaws as a person like right mm -hmm. on his sleeve but it's it's just so much more apparent because you've seen it before and it's not as good as it was before. And it's just like all turned up to 10. Yeah. Troy Duffy acts like he's the best person in the world, but he's actually the worst person in the world. And I think that's what makes him such a comic gold mine. Yeah. You know, it's he's, he's the Donald Trump of filmmaking. Yeah. Bold right? words, Ben. Bold <laughs> words. Right. He, well, okay. There are probably many Donald Trumps of filmmaking, but he's definitely a good one right yeah he's an individual who thinks he is the best at what he does and he's actually the worst at it <laughs> <laughs> and that's there's something inherently funny about that yeah and my other like as tied to that like weird bullying in this movie the saints don't even really feel like the saints in this one and it starts right out just like you said like these guys were like boston towny trash that were <laughs> calling them trash come on well you know anyway yeah yeah they but they were smarter than you'd give them credit for well, they speak five languages and then in this they're just like it starts right out like oh no we're shepherds now and it just we're continues. living a peaceful life in the irish countryside with our pappy <laughs> and it just that the, everything about it in this movie it's it's like how action like superheroes evolve where it like with like Rambo four, you're writing a movie based on like the legacy of what Rambo is rather than watching the first Rambo. You're and, trying, you're trying to match the expectations. Yeah. And that is like so apparent in this movie. There's so much like, we know the boys, they're coming. It's like, how well do you really, you kind of trailed them for a couple of weeks, 10 years ago while they killed a bunch of people. And then at a certain point you were like, we're just going to let you keep doing this. And then they <laughs> left the country for 10 years, but now you know, the boys <laughs> and they just behave. I just think so differently. Well, I think you're right that it's fan fiction. Yeah. Troy Duffy wrote a fan fiction remake of his own first film. Yeah. And which is weird. I it's But you know what? Is weird. Here's here's the here's one thing I will say. Troy, 
and you're listening, get ready. This is the part where I fluff your ego a little bit. I think that Troy Duffy as a filmmaker is much better on Boondock Saints 2 than on Boondock Saints 1. You think so? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that Boondock Saints 1, like the way that opening is edited is so fucking amateurish like intercut with the titles there's a whole scene happening in the meatpacking plant it has no sense of tone or pacing the second one is much better paced than the first one i think the cinematography is better i don't know if that has to do with him having hired a better cinematographer or if he's just actually better as a director but you we know that this happens like yeah your first movie that you make is film school you're gonna learn everything about what you're doing and then in the second movie he can actually apply some of that knowledge I think for me, I see, I definitely see that. I think I, the first one though has this like inescapable, like raw quality, like amateur quality to it. Like I get like a, a clerks type feeling, you know, where it's like the second one is technically like a better movie, Mm -hmm. but the first one has this like charm for me. It's because the first one has an original idea, which brings me back to, I'm doing kind of an inverted compliment sandwich right now. I said a lot of bad (laughs) stuff about Troy Duffy. Then I said one small, nice thing about Troy Duffy. Now I'm going to say another bad thing for 45 minutes, for 45 more minutes. (laughs) The bad thing I'm going to say is that Boondock Saints 2, Boondock Saints 1 was already a poorly written film. Boondock Saints 2 is like a a signal degraded shitty remake of that first idea, right? There's nothing original or new in Boondock Saints 2 and one almost has to wonder why Troy Duffy doesn't just try to get work directing other people's scripts. It's weird that he's so weirdly passionate and fixated really, on his own movie. He really feels the need to be like one of those writer director auteurs Wants to be the Tarantino. A la Quentin Tarantino. But the, you know, you can't, you're no Quentin Tarantino. There were even... Quentin Tarantino's a once in a generation fucking talent, <laughs> Troy Duffy. It already and happened, you, sir, sorry, buddy. You, sir, are no Quentin Tarantino. I noticed a lot more Tarantino rip-offs in this, this version. Than... This version of the story. Yeah, this, this version. Oh, my God. Um, there, the whole thing with... Eunice Bloom was it felt very Tarantino where like there's the her dialogue feels like he was trying to have it be Tarantino dialogue like it was stretched out and no one really talks like that she was verbose yeah Yeah. but it just was like a cheap knockoff of it a limp Tarantino imitation (laughs) I will say some would say it's so hard to say like I I really did think the plot of the second one was kind of cool. Like when, yeah, I didn't understand it, but when my wife explained it to me, yeah. it was like, okay, it's yeah. like a, it's a nonlinear story mm-hmm. and I, it doesn't follow the same beats as like a typical movie. And I hate to say that a movie has to follow like the same beats as every movie. So I like that he tried to do something different, but if you're going to, go against what a, an audience expects in a movie, you have to be really careful to, yeah. like, make sure that they're still following you along through the, the narration. And it kind of flops. The first time I watched this movie, by the time they got to Maine, I didn't have a fucking clue what was going on. Mm-hmm. And even after, like, a few viewings, I was like, I don't really understand what this movie is about. And when, then this time... When did they go to Maine? Uh, the Roman lives in York. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that was like a whole huge segment. Like, oh, they go to Ella Bean. You don't remember that? Um, and I, I liked, I liked that. And then I wanted to make sure I really understood the plot because you know, I, I guess I feel like if I have to talk about it for like an hour, I should at least know what the movie didn't extend that fucking courtesy to David Lynch. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're not talking... I'm glad somebody deserves that. (laughs) We're not talking about David Lynch here, Ben. We're talking about Troy Duffy. We're not here to relitigate the David Lynch series. I have have a a thing that I did at work the other day. I was going to tell you later. I'll tell you now real quick. (laughs) All right. I'm working... This was just something I did when I was bored at work the other day. I'm working on the uh, name pending. Uh, Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts tight shit list. Mm Mm-hmm. And anytime we have a disagreement about, say, Mulholland Drive or Exorcist 2 
or what's one that I like that you hated? Boondock Ex- yeah. Saints. Or Exorcist 3. <laughs> Exorcist 3. Uh, we're going to have a picture up in here of, of the things, an ongoing list of the things that we both agree are tight shit, uh-huh. including the shield effect from Dune, Resident <laughs> yes. Evil 4, yep. Cheese Pizza, uh- <laughs> Fallout New Vegas. <laughs> it, Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne. Just so we're just going to have, so every time we disagree, we'll have the list of, I don't know where it's going to go. It's going to go mm-hmm. in here if I can find on a, that tilty one ball. square inch of free space <laughs> yeah. in here. We're going to have the Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts tight shit list. The that's, official tight that's shit what it's seal called. of approval. The official tight shit list. I keep mm-hmm. going to fix my glasses, which are not on my face, which <laughs> Lau lets me know that it's more of a nervous tick than a <laughs> thing oh, I yeah. actually have to oh, do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the tight shit list. I like that idea. Now, I don't remember what I was talking about before I went off on the tight shit list. We were oh, talking about the plot of Boondock Saints 2 and how it's actually kind of a good story idea. It is a cool story. And uh, how you spent, you fucking poured over the lore. Yeah, like you have to go to those lengths because it's a, it's a complicated and convoluted story. But I don't want to make any, com- I don't know, I don't want to make any poor comparisons. But it's, you know. It's like a meal. It's my Batman versus Superman it's your Batman v Superman. It's my Batman v. We talked about Thank that. Thank you. Yes. Batman v Superman. It's your Star Wars prequels. Uh-huh. It's maybe they didn't execute the best movie, but like the story is really cool, and mm. I really do feel like that about the Boondock Saints. Like once the second, you know, the second one, once it all settled in, I was like, you know, that's really cool, and it's a shame that Troy Duffy didn't do a better job at pulling us along through yeah. that. The whole double double cross. 25 years in the making i mean to be honest i think that if he had focused on that nut it would have been good but he had to stuff too much fan service in there yeah like if you you try to you try making a new movie while also attaching it to a remake of your first movie where yeah. you have to hit all the same beats or else you think the audience is going to disown you because like this guy troy duffy is not beholden to any kind of studio infrastructure he's completely independent of everything and that's respectable but what he is beholden to is fan expectations. Yeah. And in some ways, that's the most brutally, like, oppressive structure of all. Because yeah. they don't know what they want. Uh, look at look at the new Star Wars movies. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen the second one. But, you know, go figure. You imagined a better Star Wars movie than anyone could ever actually make. You know, <laughs> like, and of course you're going to be disappointed. I think the problem... I think he could have told that story... But there were so many loose ends that just, like, didn't need to be in the movie that it mm. took up too much time that distracted you from I think a what lot of did that, matter. I think a lot of that was him trying to build up tone. Yeah. And, and to, to match the tone of the first movie. But what are, what kind of loose ends are you talking about? Specifically, like, the short assassin was in that movie <laughs> yeah. way too much for yeah, how little true. he mattered. And, and how I know, little he was. <laughs> true. <laughs> I know they were kind of trying to, like pull you in that direction and then be like oh actually it had nothing to do with him but like it didn't really need to be the the short assassin is such a fascinating character because troy duffy in my opinion is a classic case of little man syndrome he's a pretty small guy right he's not i didn't know that he's not physically impressive in any way sure he's probably about average height but he's just not Likes not the alcohol, figure. not he a flakes the alcohol, not a, a physically, lot. not a physically fit imposing fella. person. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I feel like the the short assassin is like the really short guy inside of Troy Duffy's head yeah. that just like is lashing out at everybody all the time. Yep. And he wants to do what the Saints did, but couldn't, so he had to make the Saints. Yes. In a movie. All right. Well, I'm yep. on board. Yep. I'm a good armchair psychologist. I can. <laughs> I'm following. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Other loose ends. They spent way too much time focusing on their super cool hideout, which didn't add anything to the movie other than being, hey, we have a cool hideout. And then there was a really long scene about them partying in the hideout and like reconnecting with Doc and then getting drunk and passing out and falling asleep on a pool table. Yeah. And for nothing. Like, <laughs> I thought like maybe the hideout will be like crucial to where they operate out of maybe they'll bring somebody to the hideout to get information maybe somebody will find the hideout and ruin it and you're like no they just it was just there to be cool it was and it was cool but (laughs) it needs to be there Mm -hmm. the other thing that i thought was a weird loose end in this movie was that 
the, you know when they go to the warehouse, like their first thing the back. kill the like yeah yeah with all the drugs yeah that didn't make sense and it was weird it didn't make sense but i kind of liked it it was it was funny and it was i liked how it was a well communicated scene like I, it was that's the kind of thing that makes me yeah. think troy duffy might have a good filmmaker deep down inside of him that's yeah. just hiding under layers of ego that he can't like he can't dig himself out of but I thought it was a well executed scene. Like, but it did not. You're right. It did not make that much sense. One for one, like a good thing and a bad thing. In the first one, the Boondock Saints, they they've never done this before. They mm. they the the allure of them is that they're shockingly good at this for how new they are at it. it even to the point where Willem Dafoe, Smacker the Pecker, <laughs> says. <laughs> says this is shit you see in movies this is not real <laughs> it's the kind of thing that people in movies do like this yeah. is not things the, that it, really happen and they did that on accident that was not their yeah they they pulled from their experiences which weren't real experiences mm. and somehow managed to successfully kill yeah they're just mr magooing their way through assassination and then this one was like so they go away for 10 years and then they come back and I think the th- the thought was like, oh, they haven't done it in so long. They fudged it up. But mm-hmm. I'm thinking, like, That's why would the... they be worse at it now than the very <laughs> first time they ever did it? Like it, yeah. And the I like the good thing was I like that they had either the budget or the or Troy Duffy had the thought to well, let's let's show it how they envision it in their head, mm-hmm. which was cool that it cut to that grainy grindhouse like yeah, super was, action movie with like the music and everything where everything was, was like touch. perfect with the front flips and yep. the perfect oh, bullet holes flips. everywhere it's the obvious stunt doubles during the front flip yeah it, beautiful <laughs> just yeah. beautifully cheesy yeah. and well executed literally yeah and it just like i liked that but the, the i just feel like its place in the movie just had no sense like why like, would maybe they the, suck maybe this the movie time? maybe the movie could have been all like that maybe the movie could have been all like the short assassin stuff but having it all dumped into the same pot just makes it just makes a bad stew, man. Yeah. I'm on the food analogies now. <laughs> food analogies are where it's at. I've been riding that train for a long time. Yeah. I've been riding that gravy train with oh, biscuit geez. wheels for a long time. Yikes. <laughs> That's my cheddar. Uh-huh. <laughs> soup. That's my cheddar soup. Now. <laughs> what else in this movie? Okay, can I can I talk about something from this movie for a second? Please can do. I get, can I get up on my soapbox? You can. I went and read a lot of reviews of this movie uh-huh. on, say, the IMDb, you mm-hmm. know. And and what you see a lot of, does that mean somebody needs help? Yeah. <laughs> Big bang. Hope not. Uh, what, what you see a lot of in the reviews of this movie is people laying out the, the like, the qualities that, no, really, this is a good Boondock Saints yeah. movie, you guys. <laughs> There's everything you need. Slow motion gunfights. Fucking techno. <laughs> And bad guys getting what's coming to them. That's those are the three things you need in a good Boondock Saints movie. Ten stars out of a ten. The the cover of the DVD is like it does everything but in the first one, but better. Like, <laughs> right? I disagree. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, but the the thing that really sticks in my craw from those reviews is the is the gunfights. Yeah, they're terrible. Troy Duffy has never directed a good action scene, and I'm not sure he knows how because I read I was reading uh, an interview with him on I think he was on IGN or some shit. And what he said was he he compared his movies implicitly to John Woo movies by referring to what he does as gun ballet or like bullet slow mo bullet ballet. He identified that as like a pillar, a, a cornerstone of what he does. And like, sir, no, what you do <laughs> is film people walking straight down corridors, firing guns straight out in front of him. Yeah. That's every action scene in Boondock Saints. You know what nobody ever does in any scene in Boondock Saints? Take cover. <laughs> you know what I do like, though? And I'm not disagreeing with you, but one that I did like is the when the the joke with the rope in the first one where they are suspended and yeah. spinning in the room. Like, that's kind of... That's so trying to be artistic that it's not but well, i i do like that i think it's i don't know if it's trying to be artistic i think it's trying and succeeding to be funny but it's still not a good action scene yeah right like what there's his his action scenes are like machines which you don't really want in an action scene what you want is like bullet ballet where you're taking cover and oh you have a good idea of the geography of the scene but like that scene is just they're on they're in a column and the column is just spinning 
yeah. and they're just mowing down <laughs> bad guys, right? Yeah. And every other action scene is people wa- or like the the scene in the first one where uh, Il Duce enters the picture. He's standing in the road. They're standing by the house. Everyone's shooting straight at each other. Nobody's really moving. <laughs> Nobody right? gets hit at the same time. <laughs> yeah, like... <laughs> right. Hey, what's going on inside of Troy Duffy's head, man? I don't know, but it's a pretty dark place. I, I like in the first one, he kind of addresses the... I like that they address action movies in the movie and that, you know, they make the joke about, oh, I can't, that, I can't believe there was no guy behind the bar. And, oh, oh, yeah, then you got to shoot at him for 20 fucking minutes. Like, mm-hmm. I like that, but it doesn't... I don't want that but I also don't want them sliding on their knees for 800 yards. Oh, that just was great. <laughs> shooting straight. What a great straight. shot. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Through the window, shoot, shoot, shoot. Straight, straight, straight. Or the fact that when they, when they jumped, they were upside down, and then mm-hmm. they maneuvered to spin right side up and shoot through the... Oh, it was beautiful. Yep. That's gun ballet, Ben. I don't know what you're... That's a ripoff of a scene in The Matrix is what that is. Isn't everything a ripoff of The Matrix? We should probably do The Matrix We're gonna, on the show at some please point. Please don't make me do the second and third one, though. You know what? Th- they're underrated. <laughs> <laughs> they're underrated. History has not remembered uh, the second and third Matrix movies as kindly as it should. I remember them pretty well. Remove yourself. What you need to remove is the little voice in your head that says the CGI looks like shit. Because, like, yes, it does. We all know it does. That's my biggest beef with the second one that I don't think I could watch it again was just 90% of that movie was just weird kung fu. Just, like, mm-hmm. punching and blocking for yeah. forever. That yeah. was... I, I hated that one. Yeah. I don't really remember the third one. There's a kid know. with a spoon. <laughs> and a black lady. An old black lady. The Oracle. The Oracle. Yeah. The Matrix is is really good, all three of them. The full saga that they tell is really good. Well, it's we'll have, maybe we'll... not as well done as it should have been. We'll see but... how time... Do we have to watch the Animatrix? Do you want to watch the Animatrix? I don't want to watch any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch the first one. That's I don't want to watch any of the Matrix movies. I don't want to watch an anime. I, don't, I want nothing to do with the yeah. Animatrix. <laughs> I know that anime is a slippery slope, Ben, and I'm not going down that. <laughs> you road. know what? The Animatrix is pro- is kind of like where I came into anime. That's where I got an appreciation for the wide array of anime that was uh, available in the early 2000s. It's like, hey guys, it's not just Dragon Ball Z. I tried Akira in high school, and I'm never. You, dead. Never, you couldn't do it's Akira. A dangerous drug. We ben. should do Akira. Yeah, we should. Akira is a really great movie. I know. Yeah. All right. Anyway, what else you got to say about Boondock Saints? During these fight scenes, I'm ashamed to say this. I'm going to have to say it because it's important. Yep. I liked the techno in the first one. Mm -hmm. I didn't even notice that it was in it until your wife was like, how'd you feel about all that badass techno? And then I was like, what techno? (laughs) And I was like, the sick techno. (laughs) I loved it. (laughs) Oh, man. But in the second one... It's so much worse. It's like Boondock Saints Incorporated remixes where there's like echoing of their prayer and just like, that was bad. That was real bad. It's rough. Yeah, the music is rough. It's all part of the aesthetic though, right? Because there's a type of guy who's a Boondock Saints guy and you know that guy's into techno. Of course he is. I think we're going to have to, because of our fan mail, we're going to have to talk about the Boondock Saints type guy. Um. (laughs) Your wife brought up a good point about that. Yeah? Yeah, we'll have to do that before we end here. All right. I will, I do, speaking of fan service, though, and expectations for the movie, we have to cram Rocco in there even though he's dead. Dude, Rocco is in the best scene in the movie, the dream sequence. You know what? I hate, of course that's why it's the best one. <laughs> that scene is trash, Ben. Of course we're going to divide <laughs> on the dream sequence. No, there, there were two options for what I would have liked the entire movie to have been like. I wished that the entire movie movie would have been like that big warehouse set piece with the drugs, mm-hmm. or I wish the entire movie would have been like that dream sequence with Rocco just delivering a fucking monologue. No. <laughs> and then Bill, or Bob, uh, Bob Marley on the yeah. skates coming right into the camera. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> I have thoughts about that. Yeah? Now... You didn't like the dream sequence. I didn't like the dream sequence. Mm, surprise, I like surprise. seeing Rocco. I like I like Rocco. I'm a fan of the first movie. I can call myself a Boondock Saints fan, reluctantly. <laughs> and I liked Rocco. And I think the important thing in the first one 
is that the saints have a dream. It's a literal dream where God speaks to them and wakes them up and they both come to this realization of what they need to do. There's nothing in the second one that alludes to the fact that Rocco actually speaks to them. Total fucking fan service. They literally, yeah. I think, like, I don't think Rocco even speaks to them or approves of this because he's dead. <laughs> and they just feel really sad that fucking Bob Marley died and they're like convincing themselves that it was okay. Mm -hmm. So they pretend their other good friend who died because of them was like, nah, man, I did it. I'd do it again. I loved every minute of it. <laughs> and then we go on this 10 minute fucking awful rant oh, about the I roles of men wish, in society. I wish it was 10 minutes. Why? And I don't want to sidetrack too much about it, but the, the level of like homophobe, content in this movie is mm -hmm. so much more cranked up than in the first yeah. one like i feel like in the first one it's alluded to a lot more. i think it's very much like you said like you have to look at what they're saying by what they're not saying <laughs> and in this one they just say it they just yeah. double down for you yeah. they're just like i ain't no queer okay every character in this movie lets you know that they are not gay yeah. And I, it's weird. Did you, so you've got the Boondock Saints DVD, right? Mm -hmm. My wife showed me a particularly illuminating deleted scene from I the first I haven't seen film. any of the special features. You haven't features. seen any of the special features. You should watch the scene. It's on YouTube. It's like a five minute scene where their mom calls them. Oh. They, it's, it's, I believe it was supposed to be close to the opening of the movie. He's got ice or a, a Sean Patrick Flannery has ice on his groin region. He's in the nude. Fucking Norman Reedus also nude fresh out of the shower okay this whole scene they're naked they're laying next to each other they're rolling around together it's the it's the most homoerotic thing i've seen since 300 <laughs> and, it, and it didn't it didn't make the cut and i have no idea why well you want to no talk about why. same idea fan service you do get those nude shots and that you get the zoom in of the Ooh, butt yeah. with their badass tattoos <laughs> yep. while they're Taking a shower in the barn together? No, they're not. They're not. Uh, they're bad back tattoos, Curtis. Yeah. Is, what they, is what they are. Man, those were some bad tattoos. <laughs> yeah, the cross. <laughs> not a good bro tattoo. No, no. No. Well, because you think about, and I was, I've been trying to broach this with my wife, but I have this image in my mind because it looks like they're supposed to be like, you know, when people get tattoos where you complete them by putting your arms together. <laughs> it looks like one of them is supposed to be laying down, like if they played naked. leapfrog. Yeah, it would, <laughs> it would complete. It would form a complete cross uh -huh. uh, in the middle of the leap, or like one of them would have to lay down, and the other one would have to like rest his balls on the <laughs> on the nape of his brother's neck. And then they'd have to form into like an like a Mobius strip of of human flesh. And they're and... like, "Dad, do we look cool?" <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, "I'm so disappointed in you." <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's Troy Duffy's real father. The, There's some the dad Pappy, stuff. Uh, Pappy McManus would be like, "Yes, boys, yes." You know what? I'm going to tell you in my Boondock Saints fan fiction when I reboot the series, uh, Il Duce is not going to be their father. No, no. I think. Uh, I think that was completely unnecessary mm -hmm. and definitely is just like some on the sleeve dad problems that Troy Duffy has. <laughs> yeah. Really adds nothing to the story for him to be their father, I think. Yeah. Um Yeah. You want to talk about the documentary? We got we we will we got to talk about the documentary. Speaking of dad stuff, mm -hmm. one of the first things Troy Duffy says in the documentary is that he just wants his mom to say that she's proud of him. Surprise surprise. <laughs> right? And for the whole rest of the documentary, you're on this fucking roller coaster ride with Troy Duffy and his pals. And you he's he has so many layers of ego and like and just like off putting machismo that are all covering up this hurt, sad heart of a little boy that just wants his parents to be proud of him. Yeah. Is his dad in the picture? His dad is in the picture, his mom's in the picture. I was wondering if there was like your your complex, your Oedipus complex. <laughs> there's there's something Oedipal going on, probably. I don't know which parent he's closer to, yeah. or or which one he seeks the the uh, the approval of more. Uh, but yeah, Troy Duffy, a fascinating man. He, hmm. so what keeps happening in the movie, in the documentary overnight, is that he keeps getting these opportunities, and then he he claims over the moon that 
this is the first time, oh, this is the first time this label has ever signed a band, sight unseen. <laughs> this is the first time anyone's been making a feature film and recording the soundtrack for it with their band at the same time. And he keeps making these, like, grandiose, self-inflating statements. And he, he clearly makes them so much that the people who give them those opportunities give him those opportunities, then say, mm, <laughs> maybe not you. Actually, you're right. No one has done this. Maybe there's a reason nobody's done this. Maybe this is this. a bad idea. Also, yeah. you're kind of a dick. You're kind <laughs> of a dick, and you're an alcoholic. I don't want to bend over backwards for you to take this risk now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I highly recommend this movie. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's Troy Duffy at his most self-destructive. You know, I wanted to watch it, and I, I thought, it was, for some reason, I don't know why I thought this, but I thought it was like 30 or 45 minutes long. No. And then when I saw that it was feature length, I was just like, I can't do that guy for it's, that long. It's riveting. I was like, I can't see him stroke himself and just get have the entire world shit on him yep. for an hour and a half. Yeah. He's a real interesting personality. Seems like a cringy cringe fest but the thing that he always brings up in interviews and and what the documentary does truly leave out is how he got these opportunities in the first place because there had to be something going on like, like what what i wouldn't give to have seen the footage from the room when troy duffy and harvey weinstein sat down and had the meeting where weinstein walked away saying yes i want this movie yes i want to co-own a bar with you I don't know, man. I mean, maybe... I mean, I know... Was it a bad day on the cocaine that day or something? Well, like I Harvey know, like, Weinstein... Weinstein has always been pretty, like, tight with Tarantino, so maybe he saw, like, a budding Tarantino. Maybe he thought he could do it again. Like, <laughs> I who don't knows? Know. Who I don't knows? Know. What, what, what kind of magic did Troy Duffy lay down? There's a pretty good bit in the movie where Troy Duffy, like... Troy Duffy offers kind of a heartfelt slash semi-heartfelt slash maybe deceptive take to Harvey Weinstein about like you know I'm just a kid from Boston nobody's ever given me this opportunity before I'm yeah. so, I just wanted to say I'm so so thankful to you and that's when he's just had Weinstein like turn down one of his calls yeah <laughs> and he's starting to realize like the door is shutting in his face and he's suddenly like oh Harvey you know I got to I got to say I'm really thankful to you for for what you're doing for me and it mean it means a lot to me. I'm just a kid from Boston. I've never had any big opportunities like this. This is like the failed version of Marky Mark. Yeah, like, exactly. He, he couldn't who shut appears, off the shitty boss who appears part of in the movie. Marky Mark was in talks to be in uh in Boondock Saints when it was a fully like funded yeah, when film. Yeah, like a 15 million dollar instead of deal. a 7 million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um the only two there were two can I tell you the two things that I thought were actually funny in this movie yes I wrote them down because right. there truly were only two funny moments in yep. this movie uh, the panic room joke was legitimately <laughs> yeah, hilarious like with Jodie Foster yeah he's like what was the that movie. movie with the broad and the kids the and panic room all the no, guys not that in the house one. panic house no the other one or panic room no the other one <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck it. that was gold that was good and uh, with Romeo the um, unfortunately neither of the McManus brothers had the funny moments in the movie nope. which is unfortunate yeah uh, Romeo, when he had the the janitor hostage, and he said, "I'll take the gag off nice and slow, so it doesn't hurt." That was, like, <laughs> and then he fucking slowly peels duct tape yeah, off yeah. this guy's that beard. Really, he's like, that whole scene. He's like, "No, it fucking hurts worse this way." That whole scene <laughs> like, with Romeo and the uh, and the was he a janitor? Yeah, the, with Romeo and the janitor, like brainstorming, workshopping lines. <laughs> yeah. Was, Pretty pretty excellent. I really liked that that scene. I also liked uh, pretty much everything with Gorgeous George in this yeah, movie. He was the, pretty the funny. The bit where Gorgeous George and I think it's the same guy who does the Panic Room joke. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that talking to each other scene, and they're like talking yeah. over over each other. And at one point, I think Gorgeous George says, "I don't care if you always your sister out <laughs> like a fucking Algonquin Indian." Yeah. <laughs> <or something. laughs> Not Algonquin, I forget what the... I think it was Chippewa. Chippewa. Not that I know much about Native American culture. Hollows your sister out like a Chippewa Indian. (laughs) Christ, this movie. There's a good filmmaker inside of Troy Duffy. I saw someone online on the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes phrase it as like, at this rate, in 2049, Troy Duffy's gonna make the great Irish-American crime film. (laughs) Because he did marginally improve. Yeah. Between it, between films in the ten years, <laughs> interesting. So you know what? It's all going to come down to the Bloodspoon Council. Yeah. What if the Bloodspoon Council is tight? 
It could be, you know, I or mean, if he manages just to get everybody on board for three, and it's mm-hmm. just also still a remake of the first two, but sick. <laughs> I hope it's a reboot with the same actors twenty yes. years later. Yes, that's what I want. Um, yeah, we're at almost an hour. Can I pitch you my Boondock Saints fan fiction before yes. we before we wrap it up? Yep. So here's my the first Boondock Saints one point five. Yes, but I I do have to change some things that's okay. for this to that's, fit. You got to change the universe. That's fine. Il Duce, not their father. All right. Still committed all the same crimes. Uh, but then when he he stumbles upon the saints giving their prayer before they execute this hitman, has a deep religious conversion where he realizes somehow manages to realize how wrong and how bad of a criminal he was and wants to atone for that. But still not going far enough because he still needs to think working with the saints is how I write my ways. Uh (laughs) So you got to be on there. You got to be on that line. You got to ride that line. And then they continue. They don't just fly to Boston, uh, fly to Dublin the next day. Mm -hmm. They spend the next five years just squashing crime in Boston, but nobody's happy about it. Mm-hmm. It's like weird. It's Batman. It's, it's Batman, but even less Batman. It's like nobody's on board with the Saints, and it's just a weird oppressive scary Boston where people aren't even sure that they're good guys and like no one's no one wants to go out because they're afraid the Saints will kill them. It's like V for Vendetta meets Boston. Yeah, and uh, I think, and then they go, and then when they come back, it's like the people of Boston are very, very scared of, like, mm. this force that we finally thought we were free from is back, and then Smecker's still in it, mm-hmm. and he kind of has to... He works with them to try to maybe fix what they had done, and I think we can still have the Roman, because I really do think the story of 2 was cool. It just it's like the nut, the, like, core story. Yeah, of... it just wasn't told well, but yeah. that's my outline. Yeah. Obviously, I'm still in pre-writing. I have to mm-hmm. get to writing and then pre-production. Yep. No, this is solid. And then I can't, you know, it's a Boondock Saints movie, so it has to be in production hell for like eight years. <laughs> <laughs> so we got plenty of time. Yeah, so it's yeah. got a lot of, I have a lot of time for last minute. I'm going to hire Kevin Smith so he can do some <laughs> last minute uh, script changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to hear mine? Yeah, please. All right, they get lost in the vents in the first <laughs> movie for instead of like ten minutes... For hours, and they have an extended theological discussion about whether or not what they're doing is justified biblically. And then they come to the conclusion that it's not. Yeah, and, and then they, they give com- up. They come to the conclusion that it's not, um, and they instead decide to open an orphanage uh-huh. and like a halfway house for lost young girls. And then I just rewrite the entire body of Boondock Saints fan fiction. That's good. Yeah, I'm into that. Yeah, I think we went on different directions with it, <laughs> but I think we could both find a satisfying. Maybe now I'll make it so they open an orphanage at the end. That so we can con- we can converge? We should co-write this. And then, okay, but wait. Our oh, boon- shit. Remember we said we were going to do an episode sometime about if we could make a sequel to a movie that wasn't, you know, like that we a franchise we just thought needed a movie? Yep. Hey, we're doing it right now, there baby. There we go. Well, okay, you have your Boondock Saints universe, mm-hmm. which is like the, the dystopic Boston where they're villains. Mm-hmm. We have my Boondock Saints universe where they've changed their ways and they're heroes of Boston. And then we've got the crossover event of the century <laughs> where they, a rift, a rift opens in time. I don't know. Uh-huh. Maybe, maybe the li- So does Rocco still die in your universe? Saints in time. Yeah. How can I have Rocco not die, but Romeo still come? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then uh, they need to, be, they're going to be a team of, mm-hmm. Then I just take on Troy's new movie. It's just going to be an amalgamation of everything Troy Duffy has done. Yeah, yeah. We're we're going to expand the Duffy verse. We're going to be part of the expanded Duffy, Duffy verse. verse. <sighs> I'm pretty excited about this idea now. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Maybe Let's, this will be the thing I actually work on. We'll send this to Troy and be like, "Look, man, <laughs> listen, big fans, big fans. Do you know any artists? <laughs> we thought maybe we could just give you all the credit for this. We just want to see it." We just want this. We just need this idea to come to fruition. You need it to happen. All we ask is that you fly us and our families out to the screening. All, I, all I ask is that you encourage your wife to be on our podcast because seriously, we've got some questions <laughs> for her. We are worried. We are fascinated, worried. You still drinking, Troy? Nondescript reasons to mm-hmm. you, Mr. Duffy. Mm-hmm. Luckily, he'll never hear this because these podcasts are all going in my basement for... <laughs> 
Jen and Bert to edit someday. <laughs> anyway, is that are, are we? I think that's it. I feel bad that we didn't talk about toxic masculinity because your wife had a good piece about that. Yeah, maybe it's that they are the essence of toxic masculinity. Uh, the Boondock Saints, she, as characters and as a franchise, are, are she, and I and I think that. Both of our uh, ideas for expanding the Duffyverse have some leeway to subvert that notion. I think that's way. the goal. Yeah. Either I think that's what I like about both of our ideas is they minimize that. She helped connect that line for me of my whole life not understanding why weird nerds and jocks love this movie. <laughs> now it makes more sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah that's the fan base. Thanks, Megan. Well, is that it? I think that's it. All right. This was good. This was good. I, uh, I'm, We're, I'm gonna put. Uh, uh, I guess glad I, I finally watched them. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, I was gonna say we should put it on the tight shit list, but I feel like we can't put agreeing something is bad on the. It's gotta be tight. <laughs> it's gotta shit. be tight shit. This Boondock Saints two gets nobody's seal of approval. Not on the B and C till it H show. Nope. All right, so we're gonna wrap this up. Yep. Uh, yeah. Final thoughts. Not a good movie. It's uh, not a good movie, but Troy Duffy, I wish you the best. I think you are genuinely improving as a filmmaker. Maybe consider I, I, on a, on Bloodspoon Council, he has a co-writer. Yep. So maybe that will help to to uh, iron out some of those rough edges. I'm gonna go. I, the... I'm I'm feeling optimistic about Troy Duffy's career. I think we might he we might be able to find that good filmmaker someday. But Boondock Saints two boy sure is not it. <laughs> I think uh, my hope is that he realizes he didn't realize it the first time how close he came to losing it all. I hope this time once the once the two main actors have written off number three, mm-hmm. I hope he realizes how close he came to fucking it all up and I hope he makes his great his Magnum opus, his yeah. Boondock Saints three. That's yeah. what I want. But anyway uh, next week, we're going to be talking about ooh, a favorite, one of my favorites. We'll be talking about the album War Party by Guar. Oh, yeah. Now, I gave you a copy of this a little while ago, so yeah. I know you've experienced it. Oh, yes. And I'm very excited to see what you think. Mm-hmm. So we'll be talking about that next week. I highly encourage you all to listen to it. Um, it's really, it's, it, you listen to it. Thank you. Give it a shot. You like yes. metal? Yes. Listen to it. Anyway, uh, you can listen to more Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts by subscribing to Black Gold Podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. You can follow Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts on Twitter at Ben underscore and underscore Kurt. You can listen to Ben and Kurt Till It Hurts on YouTube. I keep forgetting to plug the YouTube. Get on the YouTube. Get on leave YouTube. some comments. I'll interact with you. Yeah, oh yeah. If you leave a comment, I will respond to it. I Clearly, as you've learned from this episode, I respond to each and every piece of criticism. <laughs> and I actively seek to make the next episode a formal apology to that <laughs> criticism that's gonna get harder once we have more people that listen but you know i'll do my best yeah uh you can follow me on twitter and instagram at kurt cake 5k and that's gonna do it we talk about war party by guar next week thanks for listening goodbye bye how, how much did that clock